Let me welcome all of you to this evening's public lecture. Some of you have been on tours, and many of you will stay afterwards for an alcohol-fueled reception, uh, I hope. Uh, but we'll keep it, keep it within reason. Um, I'm Larry Goldstein. I'm a faculty member at UC San Diego. I'm director of the UC San Diego Stem Cell Program and scientific director of our home that you find yourselves in tonight, the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, this building, for those of you who don't know, is a very unusual and wonderful experiment in the development of San Diego's tech history, I hope. Uh, it's a collaboration between five separate academic institutions on the La Jolla Mesa, UC San Diego, the Salk Institute, the Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute, Scripps Research Institute, and La Jolla Allergy and Immunology. Uh, and we've uh, also are indebted to Denny Sanford, who uh, made a very generous gift to help uh, get this built along with a very generous grant from the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, uh, the chairman of the board, John Thomas is here joining us tonight, and if John's lucky, he'll make it out of here without my doing one of my customary experiments on him. But we'll see. I reserve the right. <laughs> um, so uh, those of you uh, who have not been part of this three-day uh, cess shrift of stem cells, medicine, business, and technology, uh, I'll just uh, tell you that uh, Every year for the past, are we up on 10 years now? Seven. seven. Okay, getting, getting towards 10. Last seven years, uh, we have had what started as uh, stem cells on the Mesa, or stem cell meeting on the Mesa, SCMOM for short, for those of us in the know. It's now evolved not only to a scientific meeting, but also to a business and partnering meeting as we discuss and in many cases move stem cell derived treatments towards clinical application and this year it is a, a full three-day affair. We are uh, two-thirds of the way through. Tomorrow will be the scientific meeting part of it, and the past two days have been the business part. For those of you who are not attending the scientific part tomorrow, I'll just tell you that you're gonna be missing something truly fantastic because there will be talks about the role of transformation of cancers into stem cells by genetic mutation to drive cancers. There will be talks about how we're currently using stem cells to try to understand disease and develop better drugs. There will be talks about how to use stem cells directly as therapies very early stage, as well as a very rapidly developing new area, some of which is happening in this building as well as the others, which is the development of novel biomaterials to coax stem cells into the formation of ultimately artificial organs, we hope, built from uh, cellular materials. I sometimes tell uh, community groups uh, that uh, they have arrived in the plastic factory, where stem cells are the biological plastics of the uh, 21st century. Yes, right, I got that right. Um, <laughs> and that in the coming decades, you'll see biological materials be uh, very much like plastics were for the past 50 years, where you can build almost anything of biological uh, use from these materials. Now, for those of you who couldn't squeeze into this room, and I presume you're not in this room with me now, but for those of you who get tired of standing up, uh, we are broadcasting downstairs in the lobby, out on the veranda out here, which is where the reception will be, and you are welcome to stay here or move there if you would prefer to be more comfortable. Um, so that's all I want to do in the way of general uh, comments and a welcome. I now want to turn to one of the more amusing parts of my day today, which is to introduce Craig Venter. Uh, so this now punctuates our three-day festivity at the two-day point. Um, in many ways, introducing Craig is one of the more unusual experiences I've ever had since uh, I would count Craig as friend collaborator, colleague, and experimental subject. So, <laughs> so those of you who visited my lab uh, in the past hour saw us growing Craig, Craig's brain cells in a dish ready for transplant to any worthy recipient who can tolerate the many strange disturbances in the force that we're discovering in these cells. Um, and I think Craig will have more to say about that. Um, let me give you some of the 
the facts and figures on Craig. I mean, he's a, he's a legendary scientist of our era. Uh, he's currently founder, chairman, and CEO of the J. Craig Venture Institute, which is based partly in uh, Maryland. I don't think Maryland exists anymore. Last time I checked CNN. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that's good news for us because he's moved part of the institute to San Diego and I'm hoping that the storm will persuade him to move the rest of his institute out to San Diego uh, because they've been very dedicated to understanding genomes uh, in both uh, humans, model organisms, uh, and of course plants. He's also CEO and founder of Synthetic Genomics, uh, which is a local company that's trying to effectively build artificial organisms using artificial genomes to try to develop novel foods, novel sources of energy, and uh, presumably lots of interesting things that none of us have thought of yet that might be done with these kinds of unique materials. Craig's history is unusual. Uh, he was a Navy corpsman in Vietnam. He was then uh, an undergraduate student here at UC San Diego. He left a few years before I got here, or I should say, he got out of here just before I arrived. Um, after earning his bachelor degree here, he also received his PhD here uh, with Nate Kaplan, and then went to the State University of New York at Buffalo, uh, where he worked on receptors of various sorts. He then moved to the NIH, where he really began to pioneer what I think most of us would recognize as the modern era of genomics with the realization that you could use so-called expressed sequence tags to very quickly find genes, enumerate genes, and look at how cells were behaving uh, using very rapid sequencing technologies. And this ultimately led to uh, his founding Celera Genomics, which completed the genome sequences of a number of model organisms, including one of my favorites, the fruit fly, uh, ultimately uh, the human, my second favorite organism. Um, <laughs> and a lot of other bacteria, fungi, and strange marine creatures uh, along the way. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, it's not just me who thinks he's really terrific. Uh, he's won a number of really uh, amazing awards. Uh, the U.S. National Medal of Science, uh, equivalent of the American Nobels, the Gardner Foundation Award, uh, and he's a member of a number of prestigious academic societies. Now, one thing I like to do when I introduce friends and colleagues is I like to go through their CVs and find things that I regard, not them, but I regard as interesting. Uh, so in his 50-page CV, I found that, uh, let's see, on page 16, one of his most important papers came out in the year 2000 uh, called Comparative Genomics of the Eukaryotes. That paper is important because it's the only paper that Craig and I are co-authors on. <laughs> I'm, I'm buried somewhere in the middle of 30 authors. Craig's right down there near the end, which signifies that he actually did something important. Um, uh, the year 2001, sequencing of the human genome, that was an important one, you gotta admit. That got a lot of fanfare. The complete sequence of the human genome, which he will tell you some about tonight, uh, is an incredibly important accomplishment. And then um, a paper by Levy et al. Uh, in 2007 is ultimately the reason why one of my students followed Craig on my student's motorcycle. I think you were driving a Maserati at the time and persuaded Craig to let us biopsy him. And so because of the existence of his complete DNA sequence, we reprogrammed him so that we can have his brain cells in a dish in the lab to study and do various interesting things to. We've been insulting them in various ways. And then more recently, uh, the report that you can chemically synthesize a genome of a bacterium and get the bacterium to actually run off of that chemically synthesized genome. Um, interesting books uh, and publications about Craig, another one here, Pond Scum to the Rescue. I thought that was pretty good. Uh, he's an elected member of the Explorers Club of New York. Uh, the Outstanding Alumni Award of the American Association of Community Colleges. Those of you uh, who don't know Craig probably don't know that he's not your typical straight A student in high school, not even close I gather, um, uh, but went through uh, the, the California Community College system, as many of us did actually. It's a wonderful system in California that rescues um, people who might otherwise go on to do bad things. Uh, 
and <laughs> I call them as I see them. Um, scientist of the Year from the local chapter of the ARCS Foundation, Man of the Year GQ. Was that your clothing or <laughs> something else you did? Um, Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People on Numerous Occasions, Discover Magazine's Best Brains in Science. We have some of those upstairs in the lab. And then uh, I think I'll, I'll cut it at that. I think you're all getting bored listening to me. Oh, the Petroleum Council. I thought that was pretty interesting that Craig was on the National Petroleum Council. You should ask him who he's going to vote for in this next election. So <laughs> at any rate, I think you get the picture. This is a very accomplished gentleman, colleague, member of our community. We're incredibly fortunate to have him as a member of the San Diego community and to take time out of his busy schedule to speak to us tonight. Craig. <laughs> Well, thank you, Larry, I, I think. Um, <laughs> at least he didn't cover the parts he said he was going to, so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. But hopefully his introduction doesn't come out of my time. Um, <laughs> so, so I thought I would uh, walk you through some of the exciting events in genomics. Uh, I was told this was a very broad audience, so some of you know some of these things, but uh, I guarantee the stuff at the end you probably haven't heard of before unless you're on Twitter. So, uh, so uh, one of the exciting things uh, we're doing as an experiment, uh, just at the other end of the Mesa here, uh, is building the first uh, independent research institute on the UCSD campus. So this is right on the corner of the street and North Torrey Pines, and it's rising now out of the dirt next to the soccer field, uh, and will be done about this time uh, next year. And so I think uh, it makes an interesting uh, bookend uh, with the Stem Cell Institute on the Mesa that hopefully will help uh, drive some unique collaborations. Uh, this is also going to be the, as we know right now, the world's first uh, carbon neutral building as a research building. It's, it's not too hard to build an carbon neutral office building, but building a carbon neutral research building uh, uh, is much more complicated than a lot of unique engineering went into this, uh, in including unique rooms for uh, flow uh, fume hoods, uh, water-cooled computers, uh, et cetera. So it's uh, going to be a living experiment uh, as we go, uh, but trying to show that uh, buildings and labs and research uh, can all live in a carbon neutral world, um, even though the Republicans on the planet don't think there's any need to. But uh, does that help you know how I voted? Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about uh, first uh, digitizing uh, biology, uh, where we take what I view as an analog molecule, DNA, with its uh, four bases, and when we read that information, and put it in the computer, we're digitizing it. So we're converting the A's, G's, and T's uh, into ones and zeros. And that's been going on now since 1977 uh, when uh, Sanger's team sequenced the first uh, DNA virus. The previous year was the first uh, RNA virus. Uh, but it's obviously sped up tremendously as technology has changed, particularly over the last decade. Part of the challenge is understanding that digital information. And part of proving you can understand it is what the chemists have known for some time. And, and I learned uh, here in UCSD in the chemistry department is you do proof by synthesis. So we tried to prove that, in fact, uh, DNA, uh, as we're reading the genetic code, in fact, contains all the necessary information. It's necessary and sufficient for life. Uh, so hopefully by the end of this lecture, uh, you'll be convinced that DNA is the software of life uh, and that it contains uh, everything uh, needed for that. So let me walk you through that. Uh, as you heard, we sequenced the first genome of a living species in history in 1995, and uh, five years later, we're able to scale up uh, for the first draft of the human genome. Uh, and uh, 
six years after that, the first uh, complete uh, diploid genome. And uh, to get a complete diploid genome, uh, you have to have the complete set of chromosomes uh, from uh, both parents, and that's becoming a very important part of genetics. Now, most people who are not geneticists have known that their entire lives, because everybody wonders what traits you got from your parents, what traits you've given to your kids. But geneticists have never really looked at things that way, in fact, because they couldn't. And when they got sequence, it was just looking at genetic changes uh, without any assumption of uh, where those changes came from. Uh, and so we're, we're going on to look at ways uh, to add complexity uh, to our interpretation. Vanessa Hayes uh, at the Venture Institute has been looking at global diversity, trying to trace back the origins uh, of uh, the first uh, uh, human genomes, uh, looking, uh, doing the first African uh, genome, uh, the first Bushman genome, and then went on to do uh, Desmond Tutu's genome, um, and comparing uh, my genome uh, to uh, the first Han Chinese to the first Bushman, everything came out in this sort of uh, uh, one to three percent uh, scatter that we all expected. But when you look at just within Africa and look at the different populations, it's much more complex, in part because we all evolved from people who migrated out of Africa, but some of those people migrated back to Africa out of intermixing uh, with developed populations. So the, uh, the diversity within Africa is actually greater uh, than the rest of the, the planet put together. And uh, Vanessa's team has been tracing this back to a part in southern Africa with perhaps the most ancient human genome. So those are exciting developments, but uh, understanding our inheritance comes from understanding your genetic code and your parents' genetic code. So uh, we've managed to separate the genome into uh, haploids. So in 2000, the big announcement uh, on sequencing the human genome, in fact, we and the competing government labs only did half the genome. Uh, that's because uh, it was expected to be about a dollar a base pair, uh, and uh, they felt that they could ask Congress for $3 billion, but they couldn't ask him for $6 billion. So only half the genome actually uh, got done with the assumption that you could infer the other half. Well, it turns out you can't. Uh, each of us have uh, totally unique backgrounds, and one way we get that is um, Roger Laskin, uh, who's here tonight, uh, developed single cell sequencing, uh, and now we can do a human genome on a single cell, whether it's a stem cell or, in this case, uh, sperm cells. So uh, we jokingly say that, you know, if you sequence a handful of sperm, you can get uh, a lot of haploid information. Sperm only has half the genome, and it turns out every sperm genome is different. Everybody thinks they're all the same, your eggs are all the same, and it's just a matter of getting mixing and matching. But there's roughly one crossover per chromosome, uh, and it's a different crossover event in virtually every sperm cell and every, every egg cell. Uh, so you wonder why your kids came out a little bit different. Uh, the starting material was totally different uh, each time, uh, maybe more so than you even think. Um, but that, that's something that's often revealed uh, uh, with genome analysis uh, about five to six percent of the time, but I'm sure not in La Jolla. Um, although when I was a student here, I think it was more like 10 or 12 percent, but uh, anyway, so we can get a, a genome on a single cell and sort things into haplotypes, and now we can look at something called compound heterozygotes. Instead of just looking at a single nucleotide change on one chromosome and inferring a function from that. Uh, it turns out the gene you got from your mother can have a totally different uh, variant than the gene that you got from your father. So it creates a very compound picture and it often changes uh, gene copy number as well. So uh, one of the joys of being the first to have your genome sequenced is people around the world are constantly analyzing my genome and telling me what I already died from or what I'm going to die from. Uh, I, I keep telling them it's too late to die from childhood diseases. Um, <laughs> but the, there's constant reports coming up as we're trying to learn to interpret this complex information. So uh, sorting things out in the haplotypes will become a more important part uh, of the future as we go forward. 
Now, we're not alone just with our human cells. Uh, we have roughly uh, 100 trillion human cells, but it doesn't matter how often uh, you wash your hands, you all have about 200 trillion bacteria associated with your bodies. And that's called the human microbiome. And the discovery of that uh, came some work that uh, Karen Nelson, who's now the uh, president of the Venture In Institute, and she's uh, head of the Rockville campus as well, did the first studies with this. We used the shotgun sequencing we developed for the human genome and just sequence all the microbes uh, first in the gut and then in other tissues. And so uh, we have around 22,000 human genes, but each of us have about 10 million additional genes, bacterial genes. So the microbiome uh, uh, greatly exceeds uh, our own uh, human genome. And so you can see uh, different uh, body cavities, the skin are, are loaded uh, with a range of microbes and understanding the role that these microbes uh, play in health and disease has now become a very big field. Uh, and Karen uh, doing uh, a number of studies uh, with a Vice Chancellor of uh, uh, Health, uh, David Brenner, has come up with some interesting things with, uh, uh, with GI diseases. Um, my favorite thing, and they always feel misquoted when I say this, but it's most people uh, think uh, that alcohol that damages the liver directly. It, it turns out there's a microbial toxin that's actually released in response to alcohol. And, and nobody's followed my advice yet, but I, I've argued because of this, we should actually start fortifying alcohol with antibiotics. <laughs> and then, then you can drink all you want and not have any liver damage. But, but you'll probably change your microbiome and that could be important for a number of these uh, other diseases. So we're, we're finding out almost daily uh, new uh, changes in physiology, new diseases associated with changes in the microbiome uh, to the point now where people are going back uh, to doing uh, fecal transplants to try and give a new set of microbiome uh, to individuals uh, with a number of different diseases. The science of this can improve dramatically to the point where we get it down to very specific uh, microbes uh, and give those in, in a very uh, organized therapeutic fashion. So what's the metabolic potential? If you have uh, 10 million extra genes, uh, what are they doing? Um, and so it's easy just to, uh, with a new field of metabolomics, which measures all the chemicals associated with the human body, uh, to simply measure all the chemicals in the bloodstream. So our 22 or 23,000 genes uh, produce around 2,400 chemicals. These are unique to human metabolism. So you can be very proud of these uh, chemicals. So if we do an experiment where we draw some blood from you after you eat a meal, we can find out how many of those chemicals are present. And what we find is there's about 500 chemicals circulating constantly in your bloodstream. Uh, only 60% of these are from our own metabolism. So 30% are from all the things you eat uh, in your diet, all the different species uh, and their chemicals that you're consuming. But 10% or about 50 chemicals circulating through your brain right now are from bacterial metabolites of these dietary chemicals uh, and our own human chemicals. And nobody knows yet what role they play. Do they make you feel happy? Do they make you feel sad? Uh, do they prevent disease? Do they cause disease? So we're finally starting to get a complete picture of human. We have these constant uh, 500 different chemicals circulating in our bloodstream. We have uh, 10 million different microbial genes. We have 22,000 uh, human genes. It seems like a non-comprehensible uh, set of equations to solve, but it, in fact, it makes me optimistic for the first time uh, because knowing all the components, you can finally get to an answer about biology that we could never get to uh, when the human body was basically just a black box and we guessed on these things. I recall back in the 70s when I was a graduate student here, uh, cyclic nucleotides were the big theme in, uh, in basic medical sciences. And everybody measured cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP going up or down in every tissue. And they tried to explain all of biology on these two chemicals going up and down. I mean, it's, uh, it, it seems so ridiculous today. Uh, it, it's more sad than funny that that's the nature of how science progresses very, very slowly, uh, unfortunately. 
So if human phenotype is going to be the most important next stage in understanding human biology. We can measure the genome, we can sequence your genome with some instruments and it's less than a day now for a few thousand dollars. And that cost is going to keep coming down. So it went from uh, a five billion dollar public effort. Um, uh, my team sequenced the human genome in nine months for a mere hundred million dollars. Uh, fortunately, it's come down tremendously uh, to this few thousand dollar range, but it'll probably go down uh, to a few hundred dollar range over the next decade. So sequencing more genomes solves absolutely nothing. Without understanding the human phenotype and being able to compare it to the genome, uh, we're wasting our time other than for the kind of uh, lineage studies that uh, Vanessa Hayes is doing. Um, we need to have a completely digitized human phenotype. The trouble is we can't even define a human phenotype right now. Um, th there's very little agreement uh, across fields of medicine and physiology and biochemistry. But that's a challenge for all, uh, all universities, all uh, research institutions. Uh, it, it would be nice if this was a national goal because it's the only way we will really get meaningful data out of the human genome is if we can compare all this new genetic and chemical information to the outcomes. What does it mean? And if we do this on even uh, as few as 10,000 people, we can start to answer almost every question about what's nature and what's nurture. As soon as we do it on 10 million people, we'll have very accurate statistics. And that's all your genome gives you, statistical probabilities. Uh, actuaries will love the genome uh, because it's a matter of doing calculations of statistical probabilities. That there's very few yes, no answers. So you only get to accurate information if you have very large uh, numbers. Now this new area that uh, we've been uh, collaborating with uh, Larry and uh, various groups uh, around San Diego, uh, it's a new area called stem cell genomics, applying genomics to understanding the genetics of stem cells. Uh, and as Larry said, uh, they chose me because my genome was uh, out there floating around on the internet, so it was a good uh, a starting point. And Actually, I think he was just dying to stab me in the arm and take some tissue, um, but uh, they, they did that as well. And by the way, it was an Aston Martin, not a Maserati, so please, we, we do have class. Um, uh, so you can actually start, as, as uh, Larry's team did, with a skin biopsy and uh, uh, made uh, some IPS stem cells. Um, and they did what everybody in the field sort of did. They looked to see if the karyotype picture at the bottom of how the chromosomes look to see if it was normal. And that's sort of like looking at uh, the U.S. Uh, from the space station to understand traffic patterns uh, in San Diego. Uh, I mean, it's virtually meaningless um, unless you find major chromosome rearrangements um, uh, or some extra ones. Fortunately, I didn't have any of those. But so it didn't mean very much, and then they made uh, neuronal uh, stem cell lines. Uh, and as many people apparently saw today, then they made uh, neurons. Um, and Larry told me my neurons are slowly taking over uh, his lab, and, and, and I feel like my consciousness is constantly expanding. Um, <laughs> so, I'm, so I'm hoping they start sending these cells to many more labs around the world. Um, but we did some uh, early studies uh, that Larry initiated and others had done as well, starting to look to see at a much more refined level of genomics is were there genetic changes when you make IPS stem cells. Uh, and all their early data said, yes, there were quite a few changes. Um, so we decided to uh, take it a little bit further with, uh, uh, this is a collaboration that uh, Vanessa Hayes has been uh, leading uh, with Larry trying to look at these different stages uh, from my skin fibroblast all the way through to uh, the neurons and culture, were there any genetic changes? Um, I'm kind of hoping for some favorable ones, but uh, uh, it's not clear yet. But uh, you can see here the numbers are actually quite large. And this is just looking at the fibroblasts that were made from my skin cells. This is not comparing the genome of those fibroblasts yet back to 
uh, my genome that was uh, done uh, in 2006. So there will be additional changes there. But you can see just at this first blush, and this is early on in the analysis, um, there's a substantial number of genetic changes. And looking specifically at some genes, uh, uh, Vanessa told me that some of these are maintained in coding regions of some uh, uh, oncogenes and others that are carried all the way through uh, from the iPS cells uh, through to uh, the neurons. So I, I'm not too anxious to have those neurons put back in my head yet. Um, uh, if anybody else wants to try that first, um, let us know. But I, I think the field has now gone uh, very broadly with this type of data. And even embryonic stem cells, as soon as they go into culture, uh, start getting genetic changes. What people have seen is first you lose DNA methylation patterns, and then the genome seems to get unregulated and lots and lots of changes uh, happen. So it, it's very important to understand the nature of those changes. Um, just taking a cell out of the human body changes its environment, changes its interactions, and therefore uh, changes somehow the regulation of the stability of the genome. If stem cell therapy is really going to be safe and effective, which, which I hope it will, I think it has more promise for therapy and for understanding basic human biology than almost uh, any other uh, approach that's out there, we need ways to either prevent these changes or to stabilize them. So I'm going to tell you in a few minutes about uh, all our efforts with writing the genetic code. And it turns out you can actually correct these genetic errors in stem cells uh, in culture. Uh, and numerous groups have, have tried this, and, and uh, it's even nice you can use uh, one set of the cells as a control. and. Uh, correct the genetic defect in others, uh, and it turns out the various processes for making genetic corrections in the stem cells doesn't cause further genetic change on its own. So all the new methods for synthetic DNA and writing the genetic code uh, tell us that there will be ways to rewrite uh, the genomes and put in essentially error-free or even uh, potentially enhanced uh, stem cells uh, uh, back into people uh, in the future. A uh, number of studies, here's one uh, just looking on uh, creating uh, a Parkinson's study, correcting the genetic defect in uh, one uh, path of the cells and keeping the others as a control. Uh, so it shows you that you can actually correct these mutations. And here's another study uh, sh where they tracked the mutations and showed that the corrections uh, didn't cause uh, any additional uh, uh, problems. So this is very encouraging, but there's a lot of research going on in just how to stabilize cells and what molecules are needed, what changes chemically uh, that causes these genetic uh, changes, and, and how, when you take it out of our human body environment, uh, what chemical interactions are lost. So I'm sure those can be mimicked and we can stabilize them uh, plus we can uh, correct them. This is a picture of uh, Roger Laskin's uh, robotic uh, instrument uh, that he used for uh, the single cell genomics. He's been applying this now to uh, single stem cells. So you can actually look at uh, the genome on a single stem cell uh, or you can actually do gene expression studies on a single human cell. And this is important because Scientists are now learning uh, something that shouldn't be a surprise, that our cells are not all identical. They're not all clonal. And when you look at populations, you find a whole range uh, of effects uh, looking at a number of genes. So stem cell genomics, I think, is going to be one of the most important additions uh, to this exciting uh, field uh, of stem cell biology. So we're working on uh, having a San Diego Stem Cell Genome Center that. Uh, numerous people here involved in uh, uh, trying to raise uh, funds uh, for that. So on the synthetic cell side, uh, all this work started back in parallel uh, back in 1995 when we sequenced the second genome in history. And it's the genome with the smallest uh, number of genes, 482 uh, protein coding genes uh, and 43 RNA genes. And we just asked a number of uh, questions. How many genes are essential for life? Uh, what's the smallest number of genes uh, needed to run a living cell? 
And then ultimately, uh, uh, could we design and construct a minimal genome, a minimal cell to try and answer these questions? And as soon as we went down that route, a uh, number of new questions popped up. Uh, would chemistry even permit making large DNA molecules or chromosomes? Uh, you know, we could make them, uh, could we activate them? Could we boot them up in a cell? If they're really the software of life, we needed a boot up system. Uh, after finishing the human genome, uh, we started in earnest on this, and the we here is uh, Ham Smith, uh, who's been working with me since 1994. He, discovered restriction enzymes and got the Nobel Prize for that work in 1978. Uh, and Clyde Hutchison, uh, who uh, basically is a emeritus professor at the University of North Carolina and joined the institute uh, in uh, uh, earlier uh, last decade uh, to help with uh, this synthetic genome process. And we decided to start with Phi X174. It's a bacteriophage that kills E. coli. This is the one that Sanger's team that included Clyde Hutchinson sequenced in 1977. And we chose it because it can't tolerate many errors in the genetic code. So we figured it would be a good test for robustness of synthesis. And DNA synthesis is not a very good technique. It's actually very error prone. Uh, it's called an N minus one situation where the longer you make a piece of DNA, the more errors there are. And so we developed new error correction methods we started with the sequence in the computer, and within a couple of weeks, we made the entire uh, genome. Uh, the exciting phase came next. We injected that into the bacteria E. coli. E. coli recognized our synthetic chemical as normal DNA, started making proteins. The proteins self-assembled and formed a virus, and the virus showed its gratitude by killing the cells that made it, which is how we detect it. So it'll make thousands and thousands of copies of the virus and the cell will burst open and then the virus will infect uh, other cells. And uh, this field of bacteriophage is actually coming uh, back into vogue uh, as we uh, eliminate uh, one after another uh, of our antibiotics and have developed a huge range of drug resistant microbes. Bacteriophage, the viruses that kill bacteria uh, may come back into being uh, useful. So we call this a situation where the software builds its own hardware. The software was that chemical piece of DNA. The hardware in this case uh, is the virus. Uh, but we wanted to make an entire bacterial genome, just not a small virus. But we thought if we could make a lot of these pieces effectively, uh, we could find a way to stitch them together. And that's what we started doing with what looks like a Final Four uh, playoff. Uh, we made viral sized pieces. We put four of them together. Uh, made these 24,000 base pair pieces. We cloned them in E. coli, grew them up, so we had a lot of DNA. We sequenced it to make sure nothing had uh, uh, altered the DNA sequence, and then assembled those uh, together to make 72,000 base pair pieces. And we worked our way up until we got to uh, molecules the size of one quarter of the genome. And we found that E. coli didn't really love these uh, large foreign uh, DNA pieces, uh, so we lurked looked around for a new system, uh, and we found uh, Brewer's yeast actually likes to take up uh, DNA, likes our synthetic DNA, uh, and also has another uh, unique property of using homologous recombination to put pieces together. So all we had to do was put the four synthetic quarter molecules into yeast with a synthetic yeast centromere. The centromere on a chromosome is that point at the middle of the Y you see in pictures of chromosomes. And yeast, using its homologous recombination, just assembled all these pieces together essentially instantly. And that gave us the first uh, complete uh, synthetic chromosome that we reported in 2008. Uh, and this was of the uh, genome that we did in 1995. And at the time, this was the largest uh, molecule of a defined structure uh, ever synthesized. The team kept working on uh, better advances in the chemistry. Uh, early on, we hired a young uh, postdoc, uh, Dan Gibson, uh, who made a real breakthrough. He took these steps that we were doing one at a time, and he combined them together in one test tube uh, at 50 degrees centigrade. And so it's a single pot reaction. We just throw in these small DNA pieces, drop them in this tube, heat it for a few minutes, and presto, we get assembled uh, pieces of DNA. What that means is it can be automated. 
So Dan's team at Synthetic Genomics has been automating this so we can go from just this digital world in the computer to making large pieces of DNA uh, without a lot of human uh, intervention. Uh, at the same time we were working on the chemistry, uh, we had another team that worked on the biology. And it turns out the biology was a little bit harder to solve than the chemistry. Uh, but this study that we did in, in 2007, uh, uh, headed by John Glass on the right and Carol Latigue, uh, a French postdoc, uh, made a real breakthrough. And in this study, we, by changing out the software, converted one species into another. And because of the importance of this to understanding biology and certainly to the future of synthetic species, let me walk you through that because it's very important. So we isolated the chromosome from a species of mycoplasma called M. mycoides. We treated it harshly with enzymes that chew up proteins because we wanted to show that just naked DNA uh, would work for transplantation. Uh, we also showed that only supercoiled DNA would work, so you can't have any cuts or nicks in it. We added a couple of gene cassettes, uh, one so we could select for it, an antibiotic selection, and another so it would turn cells bright blue if it was activated. And we developed new ways to move these genomes around because DNA, when it's very large, is very brittle. And you can't pipette it in the laboratory. So we developed these tiny little gel blocks and we move the DNA in and out with electric current. And we can process everything in these gel blocks. And we worked out a way to do genome transplantation of getting that genome into a recipient cell, which is a related species about the same distance we are from mice. So let me show you this very sophisticated movie we have uh, to show you what happened. So we inserted the, uh, the, the new genome into the cell. And so now we have a species, uh, the body of one species and two sets of DNA software. So what happened, uh, the new software started being read immediately. Some of the first proteins produced are the restriction enzymes that Ham Smith got the Nobel Prize for discovering. They recognized the original chromosome in the cell as foreign DNA and chewed it up. So now we have the body of one species and the DNA software of another species. So what happened? In a very short period of time, we had these bright blue cells. And when we interrogated them, there wasn't a single molecule of any kind from the original species in the cell. So when we sequenced the proteins, every protein molecule came from the new chromosome that was put into the cell. So it became very clear uh, that DNA uh, is a life software system. And if you change the software, you change the species. So we had done this now with native chromosomes. So we thought we had everything we needed to go ahead and do this uh, with the synthetic DNA. Uh, we had to find a way, though, to get the bacterial chromosome out of the eukaryotic cell yeast. Uh, to transplant it back into bacteria. And it uh, turns out we had to methylate the DNA uh, to get all this to work. But we developed this circle where we could just uh, take any bacterial chromosome and grow it in yeast uh, as a, a eukaryotic chromosome. And the whole difference is just adding the synthetic yeast centromere. So maybe the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is just this simple change in the genetic code. We can make any changes easily in that bacterial chromosome using the yeast genetic systems. We can isolate it, transplant it, and create a new species. So we thought we'd solved everything. We decided to go ahead with the new chemistry now and make the much larger genome of the M. mycoides, which is 1.1 million letters of genetic code. And to do this, we used Dan's new system. Uh, he actually made it quite quickly. We started with 1,000 base pair pieces. We put 10 of those together to make 10,000 base pair pieces. We put 10 of those together to make 100,000 base pair pieces. And we put 11 of those into yeast and yeast assembled the genome. We did the transplantation and it didn't work. So we had to develop what software engineers have of debugging software to find out where the error was because we had designed many parts of this genome and we needed to find out what was wrong with it. And to make a long story short, we found an error, a single letter deletion in one gene in one of the 11, 100,000 base pair pieces. 
We corrected that error, redid the assembly, did the transplantation, and we got the first ever uh, synthetic cell. So it just shows you how important the genetic code is in having it accurate. In this case, one letter out of 1.1 million made all the difference between life and no life. It can make the difference in traits, it can make the difference uh, or no difference at all if it's in a region that doesn't matter. This was in an essential gene and knocking out that one letter caused a frame shift and nothing worked. So initially we only got uh, one cell but on repeating it uh, we got a number of these and um, had a nice press conference and a big paper in science and, and a lot of excitement. And, but I learned starting back here uh, with Nate Kaplan that extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence to back them up and that's a constant uh, problem in science. And so one of the things we worried about from the beginning is that even one molecule of native genome, if it came across as a contaminant, uh, could fool us into thinking we had created synthetic life. So we created a unique way of watermarking uh, the genome so that we could prove unconditionally that it was our synthetic DNA and also would mark the species in the future as clearly being uh, a synthetic. And these watermarks, uh, we actually invented a new code to write the entire English language with numbers and punctuation using the four letters of genetic code. And we're not the first ones to do this, but people had done it wrong in the past. They basically used an ASCII code, and that's what George Church recently published with trying to encode a book uh, in DNA. And the problem with that is it's not biologically uh, a viable. We created a code that puts in very frequent stock codons, because the last thing you want to do is put in a, a quote from James Joyce and have it turn into a new toxin uh, that, that kills the cell. Um, you know, maybe you can only get quotes from bad liter literature and have it do that. But uh, so by putting in frequent stop codons, we will never add a new biology to the cell. The first watermark contained uh, how to decode all this new information and also uh, being the first species to have a computer as a parent, it had to have a URL built into its genetic code. So as people solve this code, they would send an email to the species proving that they had solved it and eventually uh, then we put the whole thing on the internet. So the rest of the watermarks contain uh, 46 names of all the scientists that contributed to the research, uh, the names of the institutions, and uh, the names uh, and three quotations uh, from the literature uh, that I added in because with our first genome uh, we didn't put anything from the, the literature and uh, people were complaining that we didn't put in like one small step for bacteria. Um, <laughs> so, so we tried to step up the game a little bit. And I don't know if people can read the quotes. The first is from James Joyce, to live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. I thought that seemed appropriate. Uh, the second is from American Prometheus, uh, Oppenheimer's uh, biography. See things uh, not as they are, but as they might be. And the last from Richard Feynman, what I cannot build, I cannot understand. And after this became public, obviously there was a lot of excitement about this notion. Uh, and then we got a letter from James Joyce, a state attorney, <laughs> uh, complaining uh, uh, that we hadn't asked permission uh, for the quotation. Um, James Joyce was dead. We didn't quite know how to ask him. Um, but it turns out in the US, you can use up to a paragraph as long as you uh, uh, attribute it uh, uh, properly. So uh, that sort of went away. And then we started getting an email from a Caltech scientist saying we'd misquoted Richard Feynman. <laughs> but if you look on the internet, this is the quotation that, that you find. And, and we argued back with this guy. And finally, he sent a picture of Feynman's blackboard at Caltech uh, with his famous quotation, which is actually a much better quotation. It turns out his biographer uh, inverted it somehow. So it's, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Uh, which is, you know, I think very pertinent to understanding the genetic code and being able to create life from it. So we've gone back and uh, corrected the errors uh, in the DNA uh, so that uh, Feynman can rest uh, uh, peacefully. So what is the next stage with all this? Well, we're doing an experiment right now where we've actually uh, designed the first genomes ever uh, completely from scratch in the computer. 
Uh, and we're building those now to see, in fact, if we can have a definition of a minimal genome and if it will give a living cell. Uh, and we've been discovering a lot of genes uh, around the planet that I like to view as design components for the future, the same way the electronics industry in the 40s and 50s started with resistors and capacitors and ultimately transistors and integrated circuits. At, at Synthetic Genomics, we actually have computer software for designing new life uh, software uh, and doing this for a, a variety of very specific purposes. And I won't talk any more about this tonight other than uh, uh, that we've had some real success now designing and modifying improving the efficiency of photosynthesis so we can actually get much uh, greater efficiency uh, uh, with sunlight uh, with some algae uh, that we're creating uh, down the road. But uh, people have been talking, Larry mentioned a little bit in the introduction, about how the future is changing very rapidly. So the future of manufacturing is going to be all distributed manufacturing with things like 3D printing. Uh, and the, the key uh, issues will be uh, either the instruments, uh, the IP around it, or the cost of raw materials. And so you can build in a 3D uh, machine these very, very complex uh, devices. And uh, uh, these are now cheap enough. Uh, uh, many people have these uh, at home. Uh, I've ordered one. Um, but instead of making inanimate objects, uh, we'd much rather go uh, in a, a more exciting direction uh, of trying uh, to print uh, DNA. Uh, here's an example, uh, and uh, the, obviously there's a very good local company doing this, trying to print uh, skin cells, uh, but we're back at the, at the basic DNA level. And if you think of DNA as digital information, it turns out we can send it at the speed of light. And so we're calling these uh, biological teleporters, uh, and there's a lot of different implications for that. Um, if you're living on Mars, which nobody is yet, but within two decades, uh, if SpaceX or others have their way, uh, there will be colonies on Mars. And so you can get biological material to or from Mars uh, simply as a digital information as an electromagnetic wave. So the government's been trying to find out how to reduce the cost from billions and billions of dollars to get samples back from Mars. Uh, our notion is, uh, and I'm certain that we will find life, it's a matter of digging deep enough into the uh, uh, crust on Mars, uh, of sequencing the DNA there and just sending it back, uh, and then recreating it in a spacesuit lab here, because everybody's worried about uh, uh, the Andromeda strain and sample return from space uh, wiping out the Earth, so at least we can do it completely in a secure lab and just rebuild the, the species uh, here. That there's more practical and immediate implications of this, in this with, with pandemics. So we've been working on uh, the influenza virus uh, for some time. Uh, my institute is a major uh, sequencing hub and an emergency response unit for the U.S. government in Washington, where we're tracking the genome of uh, flu from, pig, from birds, uh, from pigs, uh, from humans around the world. But many of you will remember with H1N1, it took about nine months to get a new vaccine out. Uh, 250,000 young people died in the US. Uh, everybody thinks it wasn't a bad uh, pandemic. It, it wasn't as pandemics go, but a whole new uh, group of young people uh, were obviously very adversely affected by it because they had no prior immunity. And just to remind people about the 1918 uh, pandemic, about a third of the world's population uh, was killed uh, from the flu virus. Uh, today, a third of the population would be uh, 210 uh, million people. Uh, and if you saw the mo recent movie Contagion, uh, I, I think that's not a great scenario to go through, and I think we can prevent that. Right now, flu vaccine is manufactured in the US in about 900 million chicken eggs. Uh, that creates about 300 million doses uh, of vaccine. Uh, it's a 50-year-old, at least, uh, technology, and uh, uh, we found out we can change this entire process. So we've been working with BARDA and the U.S. government and Novartis uh, to get this down to a very short period. And uh, basically, this is using digital biological uh, conversion now. 
where BARDA sends us an email a sequence of a test pandemic sequence. And our team has less than 12 hours to manufacture uh, synthetically that new uh, viral construct. Uh, and then we send it to Novartis uh, for rescue. Uh, but now we're changing this. Uh, Novartis has uh, this huge uh, plant using NBCK cells uh, instead of chicken eggs, and it's about to come online with government approval. And this plant is big enough to make uh, a flu vaccine for the entire country. We're going to be putting a digital biological converter there. So as soon as the sequence is known, we just send the sequence there digitally, uh, and this entire process gets started uh, right away uh, instead of waiting a long time. I'm predicting in the not too distant future, uh, there'll be a home version of this. Instead of waiting for distribution uh, from the government, deciding who's got the priority uh, to get vaccinated, uh, if it's a really lethal uh, disease that's spreading rapidly, uh, like happened in 1918, uh, and they didn't have all the air travel we have now, uh, in the future there'll just be a simple box attached to your computer and you'll be able uh, to download a vaccine uh, from the internet. We can send a new flu vaccine completely around the globe uh, in less than a second. So it's a matter of having the ability to do this, and obviously the FDA is going to be struggling a little bit with uh, uh, regulations uh, on this. Um, but uh, you know, distributed manufacturing will uh, drive uh, everything uh, in the future, uh, including uh, chemistry. So uh, just to conclude, future food and medicines, uh, they're going to utilize information from your genome. It's going to depend on your microbiome. Uh, what uh, Larry's doing with uh, some of my stem cells, he's making a copy of my liver uh, and feeding it the right kind of scotch. Um, and, and, uh, but you can then study uh, metabolism uh, with your own liver uh, cells uh, to understand exactly which drugs you should take. There's new niche drugs that are coming out just based on understanding the genetic code. For example, with uh, Pfizer's drug, they were trying to treat lung cancer. They did a large clinical trial. It totally failed, but a small subgroup of the patients with a single letter mutation in one gene, the drug works extremely well and causes major tumor regression in about 60% of the patients. So if you have lung cancer, the most important thing you want to know is whether you have that letter change in your genome. Uh, that means the difference probably uh, between uh, life and death. Obviously, new types of vaccines, uh, new types of drugs. If you start to think of the kinds of things that could be sent right now digitally, we can make uh, any protein, uh, send the information, make the protein. We can make a phage and viruses. And we can make, uh, right now, single bacterial cells. That's going to progress very uh, rapidly uh, in the future. It may include uh, making synthetic uh, stem cells uh, to get uh, or even uh, synthetic uh, blood. Obviously, medical foods will be based on your microbiome, your genome, uh, your environment. And they don't need to depend on animals as a source. So at Synthetic Genomics, we're actually making uh, and we need a better marketing uh, name for this, but I call it motherless meat, um, where we're actually uh, uh, making beef and chickens, um, uh, but uh, making them uh, just the meat uh, proteins genetically, uh, so you don't need animals. But the future, all this will be downloadable uh, from the internet. So if that doesn't drive you to drink tonight, nothing will. Thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't agree to answer any, but.
Well, if it was an innocent world, none of this would be a problem. Uh, obviously, anybody that uses a computer knows that roughly two-thirds of the things you get are spam or people trying to trick you or harm you uh, or uh, have a computer virus that damages your computer. So if you can actually download real phage and real biology, you going to want to have really good antiviral software because <laughs> it could make a very important difference. Um, so it's, it's going to question, you know, maybe initially, instead of just one or two facilities, like the Novartis facility, uh, maybe every major institution or hospital or business will have a digital biological converter where it can be much more tightly regulated than uh, anybody printing one at home. But it's a real problem right now as uh, DNA work goes into the kitchen. The FBI is really struggling with this. And, and so we screen everything uh, that we're making for anybody else against all uh, harmful agents. Most reputable places do, but you can buy a DNA synthesizer on the internet right now. Uh, so it's going to be a challenging world, but uh, it's a bigger challenging world uh, for new emerging infections. And we should be far more concerned with the new SARS, the new HIV, uh, the new uh, flu pandemic, uh, the things we haven't even heard of yet as our population keeps going up. So we're going to add another billion people in the next 10 years. We're, we're over 7 billion, so we'll be at 8 billion, and every 12 years we're going to add a billion people. The number of diseases emerging out of that are guaranteed to go up. So while there's going to be problems with regulation and problems with balance compared to losing uh, 200 million people randomly from an infectious agent, whether it's deliberately or naturally occurring almost is irrelevant. Uh, if we don't have the countermeasures for them of the good antivirals, the good antibiotics, um, that most of the pharmaceutical industry has stopped making because they can make much more money off chronic drug treatments than they can off of antibiotics. So companies like Eli Lilly shut down their entire antimicrobial program a few years back. Um, and, and so while regulation is a concern and the ethical issues are a concern, we're going to have to have countermeasures against new things that come out of uh, the changes in our environment, uh, the changes in our population, the changes in uh, uh, public understanding and the speed that things spread around that. So like every new technology, it's going to be a question of having the right balances, the right uh, regulation. Uh, the right sophisticated software. Um, yeah, so the question, how long before synthetic biology will have a meaningful impact on energy production? Basically, the wild card in energy produ production right now is if, if we don't have a carbon policy and an effective carbon policy soon, biofuels are just dead, you know, once again. So it doesn't matter what the scientific breakthroughs are, uh, there's no way to ever beat oil. And in fact, oil's not even an issue right now uh, because of all the new natural gas discoveries. So there's no way economically for a new fuel made out of renewables to ever be able to compete with something an oil company can do without sharp federal regulations and a sharp carbon policy that says you can't keep just taking carbon out of the ground, burning it, and putting it in the atmosphere. I until we recognize the importance of that, there is no biofuel industry. Behind you. So the question is, uh, what, what's going to be more effective, uh, remaking a new limb or mechanically manufacturing one? Well, right now, it's clearly mechanical manufacturing. Um, we, we haven't learned what lizards and some other reptiles can do of growing a new limb. Um, 
So I, th I think that's a ways down the road uh, for any stem cell biology, assuming it's ever going to be possible. Um, but uh, I think it's going to be a combination. In, in fact, what our work shows is the absolute interface between the digital world and the biological world. So maybe the artificial mechanical limb will have real skin uh, made from a local company here that makes skin uh, to grow over the mechanical arm. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of different possibilities.